hello all. Um, I'd like to introduce Renfei Feng, who's a senior scientist at the Canadian Light Source. He'll be giving a talk called Advanced Materials Characterization Using Synchrotron Radiation and the Potentials in Human Origins Research. Um, you can take it away, uh, Dr. Feng. Sure, yeah. Well, thanks for the introduction and uh, also thanks for the organizer to invite me to give this talk. So I'm not uh, the expert in your field, but uh, my background is, uh, is physics. I'm a physicist. So my view to this talk is actually from the materials characterization point of view. See what is the, what is the potential of these things and you know applications in the human origin uh, research. So when I was giving this uh, topic, so the first things I'm thinking about is what is unique in the um, uh, uh, in terms of material characterization in human origin. So first is the sample. So I look all those one, those uh, questions from the material characterization point of view. So the sample in this field is often invaluable. Could be very big, like the, the dinosaur boom, like a uh, human skeleton, this kind of thing. And it could be very small, like the, uh, uh, food residues or the uh, dental calculus, for example. And sometimes this are covered uh, under the, uh, other materials or mixed with others. So this kind of give us the, the uh, kind of requirement. It's good, it would be good if it's a non-destructive uh, technique used for the researchers. And ideally it will have the high sensitivity, high penetration powers, and possibly the high spatial resolutions to look at the, the small ones. But usually the question we ask when we look at the materials or the samples or the fossils, this kind of things, we have four different kinds of things we want to ask. First, what does it look like? This is easy to look at externally, but how about internally, what's inside? What is it? or see what's the composition of those, those, those uh, sample, samples, elements or their distributions. Or how are they structured together? Is it atomic arrangement, maybe the phase structure, this kind of things. And also what's the chemistry in there? So those fit very well to the X-ray uh, techniques. So here is I have four pictures here show you what X-rays, why X-rays is so useful. First, you can see something you cannot see by your bare eyes, right? And you can use some technologies to look at the atomic and molecular structures, such as diffraction. You can do the spectroscopy analyze, you can get electronic structures or bonding structures. And also you look at the, the use the polarization property, you can see the uh, magnetic structures. So those makes the, the X-ray very useful. But the source we're talking about today uh, is not the conventional source, it's a synchrotron. The synchrotron radiation here uh, is, is basically, we have a humong uh, humongous machine there with, which, uh, with the size of a football field one or a few or tens of football uh, uh, field size. So this is accelerator-based uh, source. So here is a small portion here is a linear accelerator. And this is a boost to boost the energies. And uh, then when energy reach a few gig electron volts, we put it into the big ring here, we call storage ring. And along this direction, the tangential lines, we take this light and build to the so-called beam lines with the select energies, select techniques, or whatever you want. We'll do experiment over here, okay? So this is thing that looks the uh, uh, picture here is cartoon. Basically, when you have a charged particles traveling around, each time it changes the velocity or changes directions, it will give out radiation. So the trick here is that this, the electron here, a charged particle is traveling near the speed of light. So in this case, the radiation will go straight forward like the pencil beam. So uh, in that case, we have a very, bri very bright beam. And the property here, the first is it's very, very brilliant. 
So many, many, many orders of magnetically high brighter than the conventional source. So then it could give us, enable us to do some quick experiment or give us the high sensitivities. The second one is that this one is have a continuous spectrum. The energy covers from far infrared all the way to the hard X-rays. So you can pick whichever you want the energies for your experiment. The third one is again the collimated beam. So over long distance, you, have, you still have a limited size beam. You can use optics to either expand the beam to bigger or focus it down to tens of nanometers. Uh, also this light radiation or light is polarized. So that gives us opportunity to, to do the spin related measurements. And the, that, the fifth one is that you see the electron is not continuously traveled there. It's bunched together in the, in the picoseconds time scale. And between those bunches, there's a nanoseconds, a dark period. So in that case, we can actually use this one to trick some kind of a process and the look the kinetics of this one. So all those properties makes a very good use of spectroscopy, microscopy, and the kinetics. Okay, so where to find those source? You see those blue, uh, green, uh, yellow dots, red dots here. Those are the, all the such kind of facilities over the world. Some are more advanced, new generation, some are old ones. There's a bunch of there in Europe, there's a bunch of there in uh, East Asia. And uh, in North America, we have a few here. And there's a, a effort there, the Africa is not there, but currently there, there is an effort to promote, to build one over there. Over North America, here is Canada. So we are, the Canadian light source is actually the only such kind of facilities in Canada. And it's located in Sask Saskatoon here, not far away from Calgary, not far away from uh, Regina. So sort of in the middle of the country. And this, this is located in the University of Saskatchewan here. On this side, the other side of the river is the downtown of Saskatoon. So this is the building of the Canadian light source. And that's the friendly view of the, the facility. Look into there, this is a layer up. You see here, this one is a linear accelerator, produce electrons and accelerated to 200 micro electron volts. Then we bump this one into this booster ring to accelerate the boost energy to 2.9 gig electron volts. Then we put it into the storage ring. So each tangential lines here is one of the beam line. We have 22 of uh, operational beam lines here. Each beam line is, is sort of specified to a certain energy range from in far infrared to hard X-ray and has a different uh, techniques there uh, provided to you to use for a certain kind of characterizations. Uh, depends, the, the, the technique is highly depends on the photon interaction uh, with the matters. So you look at the incoming photons here and the outcoming uh, product could be the same energy photons or the different energy photons or electrons or others. So it depends on what we're looking at. If we look at the same energy photons, there's elastic scattering. So there's actually diffraction techniques uh, over there. And if we look at the photons, immediate photons with uh, different energy, there's inelastic scattering. That's actually fluorescence or emission spectroscopy. If we look at the electron emitted from there, that's the photon electron spectroscopy. Or we can look how much photons get lost, get absorbed by the material, then it's X-ray absorption and spectroscopy. And uh, within the energy range of synchrotron radiation, the most dominant one is the photoelectrical uh, uh, process, then as the elastic scattering, then in elastic scattering. Let's do some simple physics. Here is a simplified uh, atomic uh, mode here. The nuclear with the positive charge, they attract a whole bunch of electrons surrounded by, which has the shield structure. Each shield, you have a certain amount of electrons staying there. And when the photon come into there, 
If the energy of photon is less than the binding energy of this electron, it won't do much, okay? Until this energy get equal to the binding energy, you actually can remove these electrons out. But if the energy is higher than the binding energy, you actually have, can give some uh, kinetic energies to this electron, so the electron can travel out. When the electron getting out, there's a cold hole created here, but this system is not stable. So the out electrons will bump, uh, you know, jump in to fuel these ones, then give the extra energies out as the emit photons. This is exit fluorescence. The difference of the energy for is, is a specific for the different kinds of elements or atoms. So that gives us a fingerprint for the elements. Uh, this is the kind of uh, schematics of the typical uh, uh, beamline settings, understation, understation settings we call here. So this is a source for photons. Then we can have a monochromator here, switch in and out to select the different energies. We can use some kind of optics to focus beam. Then you can put the samples here and around the sample, we have a whole bunch of detectors. You can detect the X-ray fluorescence uh, spectra and you can do X-ray diffractions and you can scan the energies of the incoming photon to the X-ray absorption measurements. So the techniques uh, in general here, we're talking about to answer the four questions we asked on the first, the first uh, slides. So X-ray image, uh, X-ray image give us uh, uh, basically the view of the materials. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, conventional radiography techniques and condition, and you know, the, you, you probably know some CT computer tomography ones in the hospital. And the synchron radiation actually have give you some fancy uh, tools, which is a phase contrast imaging, diffraction enhanced imaging, KH subtraction, uh, KH subtraction image. All those techniques can combine with the, 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 the CT to give you a much better contrast of the, the, the material and also the uh, sensitivity to the soft tissue uh, imaging. But this is, is, it could be a totally a different uh, top, uh, talk today, but today I will focus on the other three techniques here. One is actually fluorescence which gives the knowledge of elemental composition and distributions within your sample. And actually absorption gives you the chemical speciations and the local coordinations. Those are the short range interactions within the atom or molecules. And also we have actually diffraction techniques here give you the, uh, basically the structure, the atomic arrangement or we call that the phase composition or orientation distortion, this kind of information. This is in the relatively longer range of interaction. Uh, this is uh, sort of just give you an impression about what X-ray fluorescence looks like. This on the left-hand side, this one is X-ray fluorescence spectra collected from a NIST standard samples. You can see each of those peaks actually correspond to one of the elements, and we can measure tens of them uh, at the same time. Okay, and if we actually focus the beam to very small, we can pick this kind of uh, uh, spectra at very small pixels, uh, such as like a microns. Then, if we move the scan the samples around, we can get this kind of image. So element distribution, different elements, how they distribute within the samples. And the second, the second technique is actually uh, absorption spectra. So this is actually a typical ones. Uh, we usually divide into this one, this one into three regions. One is we call pre-age is here. And this one gives us the information from valence continue and some diet forbidden transitions in this part. And the big jump here is the near age. This is uh, uh, formed by the dipole allowed transitions. So the information here would include the electronic structures, coordination chemistry, and uh, uh, molecular orbitals, uh, you know, all these kinds. Also this position, the age position is element specific 
and oxidation sensitive. So use this one, we actually can get this information. The third region here is the extended X-ray absorption fine structure region. This one is formed uh, by the uh, interference be, uh, of the photoelectron waves with itself because there's a neighbor uh, atoms and molecules there, uh, you know, scattering uh, wave back, then the interference effect. So this will give us information about the intermolecular distance, coordination structure, and the neighboring atoms, this kind of information over there. And the third technique is X-ray diffraction. Depends on what kind of beam you are using. Is a is a polychromatic uh, poly, uh, polychromatic beam do the Lowy diffraction or monochromatic beam do the powder diffraction? That depends on the sample. And uh, this is in two D ones, but people are probably more familiar with the one D ones, which is basically integration along those rings give you the intensity over two theta or d spacing this plot. Then compared to the, the database, uh, the database, then we can figure out the structure of the, this one. It's, it's also a sort of fingerprinting technique. And uh, the picture I'm showing now is, uh, is a diffraction uh, pattern get from the soil from Mars, which is sort of give you an impression of real world of what this, this uh, diffraction pattern would uh, look like. Okay, so with that, I'll show a few of the application cases, you know. Again, this may not exactly uh, uh, human uh, origin related things, but it's something similar. And uh, the first example here I'm showing is, uh, is uh, I call it a Dynabird fossil. So this is uh, actually the, the fossil uh, discovered in, in Germany, but it's provided by uh, Wyoming uh, uh, Dino Center. So uh, this is the fossil itself, and uh, which uh, of course is embedded in the, in the uh, host stone. And uh, look, this one, the picture here is actually the forceful distribution we measured here. It gives the full pictures of that. And I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen, uh, here, over here, you actually can see the, the wing of that. So it's a kind of a feather is structured there. And also you can see some bro uh, broken bones there, which is reconstructed, but over the actual fluorescence, you actually can see those are the broken ones. Uh, the white box here in uh, within that, uh, we scan those, those uh, other uh, elements. Uh, so I put the picture here on the right hand side. The red color here uh, indicates the, the calcium elements there. And the green one is a zinc. And this is kind of a bluish ones is the magnesium. So host stone, this is a host stone, is is a nylon stone. So it's, it's definitely high calcium in there. But if you look at this one, the green ones, the zinc ones, it's all sort of within the bone structure. Well, this is actually originally, suppose we originally stayed there and it preserved over hundreds of millions of years. Okay. This is one of the, one of the example. And the second one I'm going to talk about is, uh, <coughs> is uh, one of those pieces of the, like the ceramics. It's a well-known uh, uh, ceramic uh, uh, appear in Italy, you know, the, probably 50 years BC and they're called uh, Tara Stilata. So there's a red color or the gloss ones, you know, over there. So it's famous in building the table walls or this kind of things. And the one kind of that has a, you know, ye yellow kind of background with a red veins through that, that calls marble uh, Stilata. So what do we do? We actually pick a small cross section there you can see that there's a kind of a yellowish slip there. There's a red, uh, red ones here. Then there's a kind of a, uh, the body part there. And we do the X-ray diffraction and X-ray fluorescence at the same time. So this is the X-ray diffraction patterns. We can see that. And look at down, down here, we actually have fluorescence map here show us the, 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 those strip uh, structure here. 
And also we have what we call that the mineralogic, you know, the phase distributions of five different uh, mineralogy phases, including the hematite, like the crondon, this, this kind of things. So you're not just seeing the element distribution, but the mineral phase distribution. Uh, <clears throat> this is another case, uh, the hidden paintings. This is, is, again, this is not exactly the human origin kind of things, but it it's basically can showcase some things that you can, uh, you can do over there. This is a piece of a painting from Van Gogh Museum. Okay? It's, a, it's a patch of grass. When you put the X-ray beam there, you look the X-ray through that, you kind of see this, this kind of images. And, but if you take the actual fluorescence from there, you could see all kinds of uh, elements there, copper, zinc, lead, uh, some mercury there, some uh, antimony there. And the mercury we know is sort of associated with red color uh, uh, pigments. And the, the, uh, the antimony one, you see the actually uh, near HD spectra we did here is actually tell us the strontium is actually coming from the lapis yellow, this color. So if we scan that, we do the red and the yellow reconstruction, we got this kind of image here. Okay, this is actually a very similar to another painting, uh, Van Gogh's once is the head of a woman. Yeah. So that tells us is actually under this, this uh, uh, patch of grass painting underneath there's a, there's another one which is the head woman is painting so the the grass is actually painted over to the old uh, uh, non satisfied painting of the, the head woman so this this uh, technology is used for uh, uh, is also used for the, for example fade the, the documents the, the ancient ones and the degrade uh, photos, this kind of things, you can actually recover those ones by using the X-ray uh, uh, technology. The, another piece of samples from the dinosaur, which is from uh, Trudon, uh, Tooth and Nemo. The sample is coming from uh, Alberta Dinosaur Provincial Park. Uh, you know, it's, it's provided by the, the Royal Museum in the Drumhalla near Calgary. So we did some uh, uh, actually fluorescence mapping in this dash. So this is a dashed box there. So it can, uh, can it, uh, it sort of showing us some kind of orientation of post structures over there. And within there, you see a tiny bit of the copper zinc there. It's probably is is sort of. A, uh, happening during the fossilization or mineralization, the environmental things pop into there through this structure. 